first. Uh, I've lived in town for a long time. I don't know that there's been another author series like this in town, so in many ways this is a first, but certainly at the uh, Sandwich Arts Alliance, this is a first. We're going to be featuring every author who has a book for sale over here, two each week, and this is an opportunity for the public, for other writers to get to know our, our local writers and hear what they've been up against, what they've accomplished, where they came from, and why they do what they do. Um, so I'm uh, very pleased to um, introduce the, the two authors that we have. Dean Coe, you'll hear in just a second, um, started writing the Chesterton books. He'll tell you all about that. And he was formerly a, a headhunter and a YMCA camp director. Um, and we can maybe find out what's his favorite. We know his favorite character is Chesterton, but maybe we'll hear what his favorite book is. Um, and a little bit more about uh, his, his writing. Uh, Janet Dillon has, let me see here, uh, she's been writing since the age of three and has <laughs> eight books. And we writers, we understand that's, you know, that's kind of the way it goes, right? Um, and publishing since uh, 1992, all children's books. Uh, and she was an art teacher in Situate and, and Littleton uh, K through 8 public schools. So both of our authors today have a great deal of experience in children's writing and in dealing with children. And so I'm very pleased to first of all introduce Dean Cole. So Christy has said this is our first. And I guess I'm the first. We flipped the coin. And, uh, so there's been no rehearsals. Um, I have no idea what Janice is going to should I say, and she doesn't know what I'm going to say. That makes two of us, because I don't know what I'm going to say. Um, but I guess, um, I guess I'll start with um, a conversation about my first book um, and how I got there. Um, I think it probably tells a little bit about how I write or what I'm, what I'm all about in terms of my writing. Um, Chesterton is a weasel. Uh, my granddaughter and I were walking in the woods when she was 11. We saw this little creature that was running from some dogs and um, um, came and stood in front of us in the trail for just a moment and kind of stood up and looked at us and gave us a like, what are you doing in my woods look? And, but I liked this guy. He had an attitude about him and I couldn't get him out of my mind. I didn't know what it was. We went back and we got online and determined that it was in fact a weasel. And so I started to write a story about him and then another one and another one and I finally um, and I'd never written, I'd written for my business, for work, I had never written this type of, uh, or ventured into something like this. Um, so I went to a children's librarian and gave her four or five stars of something, and she said, you know, you've got something here. So then it was a question of, okay, if you're going to publish, how are you going to do it? Um, and I'm a very impatient person, and I was not going to, and I also lacked the confidence to go to a publisher, and I didn't want to go that route. I just didn't have the patience to have somebody tell me that it's going to take two years to get your book out. Of so I decided on self-publishing. Um, the, um, at the time, it was the Sanford's 375th anniversary. And I thought, hmm, this is, a, this is a good time to bring out a book about a sandwich. Um, and I, I, I have a marketing background. I was self-employed. I had my own business. I only ate what I killed. Um, so um, I approached things from more from a marketing standpoint, I think, than a lot of writers do. A lot of writers absolutely fear marketing. For me, I love it. Um, and in fact, 
it's a distraction because it gets in the way of the writing. So anyway, I started the children's book on a weasel and the boardwalk and sandwich. If you haven't been there, you've got to go take a peek at it. But the boardwalk and sandwich has always meant a great deal to me. And I've had personal involvement in the rebuilding back in 1990. And so it's been a, it's, so now I've got a passion here of a boardwalk that I love, a place that I love. And I've got this character that doesn't even have a name yet. Mm -hmm. But there's a weasel, and weasels don't hang around boardwalks. So how do you put, how do you put a story together? Mm -hmm. And um, so it's I hadn't really I hadn't really come up with my story yet. I had I, I knew it was going to be something about nature, and it was going to be, and I had a character, and I had a place. There were some rumblings in town at that time of, of the selectmen, a couple of selectmen wanted to say, uh, wanted to ban jumping off the boardwalk, which by the way has gone on since 1875. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, literally. And uh, so I thought, hmm, uh, kids book, jumping off the boardwalk, maybe there's something here. Yeah. And so I started the story but in all honesty, it didn't wind up as a kid's book. It didn't even go where I thought it was going to go. It wound up as a, as a family, non-generational book. I mean, it, it doesn't, it, it probably should have been a coffee table book. Uh, <laughs> but it, it doesn't, um, so it, it doesn't fit the form. And I'm glad I decided to do not, uh, to publish myself because no publisher would have would, would have done it. It just didn't fit the, the norms at all. Um, so that's how this got started. And uh, when I decided that uh, I was going to publish, I needed an illustrator. And I can't I can't draw stick figures. Uh, <laughs> So um, I had to get an illustrator, and I had an idea. This is going to be a local book. It's going to be about the boardwalk. Kids jump off the boardwalk. It's a rite of passage. I'll get kids to do the illustrations. And I met with some art teachers and school people, and, and they said, and I, what I wanted to do was get one picture from each grade level and have 12 <laughs> illustrations in the book. Wouldn't that be cool? And um, I met with some teachers and art teachers and they said, you, you, you'll go nuts doing that. No, no, no. And they said, if you, want a, if you want a kid involved, then go to the high school, find a good student, an art student, and make it work. So I did. I found uh, a kid that had been, uh, was a senior. She was great. And she had done the sandwich night buttons. And she, she was just a good illustrator. And I gave her the script, and she said, yeah, let's, I can do this, but I need help. And I haven't put a book out. I don't know anything about illustration. So I had to simply say, OK, whatever you need, let's, let's get it done. She wanted to have a girlfriend of hers also work with her. They started, and I still didn't know how they were working together. But what happened was, the way they divided it up, was um, one of them liked to do, this is terrible, isn't it? The light in here. Yeah, it's, 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 it's okay. It's the window. Is this light? No, it's the window. Oh, cool. So, anyway, one of them. One of them liked to do the characters, and the other one liked to do the background and the colors. And she was nuts about the colors. And, um, uh, and, and the colors are, are great through this. Um, so that's the way they divided it up. And we got it out uh, for the 375th anniversary. That's woven into the story. You know, we talk about the party. and. Um, basically created, recreated an experience that I went through back in 1990 when I was the founder and chairman of the rebuild of the boardwalk after the perfect storm and after was So I revisited the celebration that we had um, in here with that. <coughs> um, 
so that's this book. Then it was, uh, okay, what's next? And, you know, I've got two illustrators. They're graduating from high school and um, ready to go on to college. One at Savannah College of Art and Design and the other one at uh, Northeastern. Then I had another idea for a book, and I don't even remember which one was the second one. I guess uh, um, the whale book was second. Um, and um, this was based on this was based on a, uh, a true experience that I had kayaking in the marsh, and I came across a pilot whale. And uh, this, sure, absolutely. Um, so th this is um, this is based. There's emotion in this because it was based on a personal experience. There's emotion in that because it started with one and had some meaningful stuff through it. Um, and uh, so I guess Rob and they were both sophomores when we did this one. We're starting sophomore year, and then uh, the last. Um, I don't want to go through each one of these because I don't. Five minutes, okay. Um, so that book is about some puffins that get blown in on a nor'easter, and uh, a weasel saves the puffins, right? <laughs> of course. Of <laughs> course. Um, this one is about the um, the the, the, um, uh, the New England cottontail losing its habitat, being forced out. So the whole, issue, the whole story is using the bunnies as um, a way of uh, getting into habitat loss for animals. And of course, uh, Chesterton saves the bunnies. Why wouldn't the weasel save the bunnies? <laughs> Makes dinner better. Um, so, and this was the last one. Now on this particular book, Robin had stayed with me. Sasha, the Northeastern, had dropped out because she was in overload and doing what students do, and uh, especially they have a Northeastern has a program for you know work study or whatever it is. So. Yeah. yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, so I lost her. Robin wound up doing everything on this one. She wound up doing characters, background, and she did the book design. So it was great. She is now an animator in New York as a freelancer. And Rob and uh, Sasha is uh, in technology and illustration and both have graduated on. Um, let's talk about questions or thoughts. I, mean, that, I, I had some brief conversations early on. I know we got some artists and we got writers in the group. Um, pardon? Questions again. Oh. Oh, okay. You hold on. I'm going to close it again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have to keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm done. I've reclaimed. I've pulled it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, So this is Janet uh, Dillon. And uh, thank you so much. We'll be looking at your books and hearing your stories. Right. Thank you. Well, Jana Dillon is my pen name. Oh. And my real name is Janice Marie Christine Gorolskis Doherty Hamby. <laughs> 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 so, so I took my nickname that my sisters call me and my friends call me Jana. And I took my grandmother's name name because it was the easiest to spell for children, because if I knew it was Karolskis, and I was in the process of getting divorced from Mr. Doherty, so um, I decided to go with her name. So um, now when I'm doing paintings, I have the problem of trying to decide, will I sign them Jana Dillon, or Jana Dillon Hamby? And so I've been vacillating between the two. Sometimes it's so hard to write with oil paints that I just go for the Jana Dillon. Now, I'll tell you how I got started. When I was three years old, I couldn't write, but I could illustrate. So my father was at the time going to the museum school. He had just graduated from Northeastern. And so he would be at the Museum School of Fine Arts. He would come home with books for us, would read the books. And in our imaginations, we were writing books too, my sister and I. 
So um, that's how I started. And I used to entertain my sisters by writing stories, comic books, things like that when we were little. Now, when um, after I was starting to get divorced, I thought, oh, well, I've got to find a career that I don't want to go back to teaching art because that'll be way too much. So, and I had two little children, so I decided to start writing and illustrating children's books. So what I did was I wrote the stories, I would send them in with one illustration, and I kept getting rejection after rejection. So finally I thought, all right, I'm going to have to write something that really just hits them over the top of the head with, that is so good. So um, what I did was I wrote the story Jeff Scarecrow's Pumpkin Patch, and I'm going to show you how I sent it out to six publishers. Um, I did a little book dummy, and I'll show you how I started it. First, um, I was daydreaming about fall and how some people decorate um, with pumpkins and scarecrows and other people with scary Halloween things. So I started thinking, what if a pumpkin was alive and who would he live with? I'm not a pumpkin, it's a scarecrow. What would his problems be? So I wrote the problem and the solution. I had the characters, and then I wrote the story. And I wrote it in um, first in pen, and they were like it was about this thick with corrections. And finally, when I got it down to 12 pages, I said, "All right, now I know this is going to be the manuscript. I'm not going to send it in because I really want them to look at it and consider it." So I did um, a little thumbnail sketch setup. So most children's books are 32 pages. So what I did was, I folded a piece of paper into 32 little sections, and then did all the illustrations inside. Really messy, but it made me kind of rethink the book even, because I could see how it was flowing. After I was done with that, I took out a pencil, and I did a really good um, black and white illustration for each page. And I spent four months on these, just worked on them all the time. Then after I was done with that, I put together a book to and I just bought a notebook, I sewed it together with dental floss because it's so strong. I glued in all the pictures and all the words, and I sent it out to six publishers. Two weeks later, I got a call from Houghton Mifflin, which is now Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Mm -hmm. And the um, editor was Mary Lee Donovan, and she said, oh, you love it, we're going to publish it. So I was so excited, and I sent out um, notices to other publishers that it had been taken, just as a courtesy. And I also got one rejection in the mail. <laughs> so um, as soon as they gave me the size and dimensions, I got started on the illustrations. So what I did was I used watercolor and colored pencil, and I tried to make each one have a mood to it, so that it wouldn't just be you know a literal illustration. It would be colorful. It would evoke memories of old-fashioned books, but still be contemporary, especially in the colors. So once I was done with all of those, I mailed them in. Um, I remember driving into Boston, sending my son out, I think he was like six or seven at the time, ran into Houghton Mifflin, dropped off the illustrations, and then drove off. So finally, it took about two and a half years altogether, but finally the book came out. Now, um, my editor left in the middle of the preparations. So um, I did, once the book was done, the communication was a little bit off with Houghton Mifflin. So I would go to elementary schools and do presentations, and the kids would say, have you won any awards? And I would say, no, but I'm hoping to someday. Well, it turned out 18 years later, when the book was going out of print, they call, I saw they called it award-winning. And it turned out that it was a finalist for Best Book of the Year from um, Nickelodeon's magazine, Nick Jr. magazine, and um, Book of the Year from this Association of Independent Booksellers, which used to be called Booksellers. So, 18 years later, I find out. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, what a horse. So, um, then once it got out of print, what I did was I got the copyright back, and then, um, which they'll just give you. They go ahead and get the copyright for you, they just keep it there, and then they can mail it back to you and got permission to get it republished. So it got republished by Pelican about two, three years ago, something like that. So that's the story of Jeb Scarecrow's pumpkin patch. Now, after Jeb got published, five years later, <laughs> I got another book published. It was Lucky O' Leprechaun. And the time, by the time it got published, I was like, oh my goodness. 
this. I want one hit wonder. <laughs> but, um, so when this book came out, it had been rejected 26 times. The 27th time, Pelican took it. The reason it was getting rejected, the um, different um, publishing houses were telling me, was that there wasn't enough um, call for leprechaun books, or St. Patrick's Day books. But because I had been going into schools, I know that all March is all about leprechauns. It's how they get the kids to write and do science, grow potatoes. Uh, they do leprechaun traps. So I wrote a book about a leprechaun trap. And in fact, a teacher actually said to Lily to write a leprechaun book. So that's how I got the idea. And I'll show you one of the illustrations from it. Um, in this book, they wouldn't let me put a frame around it because they had had a hard time with things being off center with their printer, but this is what it looks like originally. And you can see it's just about the same. They're really good at copying it. So, um, that's how I got that book done. And once it got published, it got sold out. It got sold out again. It got sold out again. It was wonderful. So they asked me to write another one. So I wrote, Lucky Old Leprechaun Comes to America. And this is about how he accidentally came to America. And it was an idea my grandmother had given me, because she told me that um, leprechauns used to sneak into people's suitcases when they were to America to get their gold if they had hidden there. And she said it, when you got to when they got to America and you opened up the suitcase, out would jump the leprechaun. And she said the rich families like Grace Kelly's family and the Kennedys break the leprechaun and they have made their wishes. Everybody else, the leprechaun was out in the backyard. So then this one did well too. So they asked me to do another one, and this is Lucky Old Leprechaun in School. And this is the one that the kids really love. Um, because when I'm reading it, they're in school. And when I get done reading Jim Santa's Punk and Patch and Fall, kids just automatically applaud. But when I read this one, they're sitting there in silence staring at me because they're thinking, there could be a leprechaun <laughs> hidden in the ceiling, like Lucky, or down in the cafeteria, or taking a bath in the sink at night. So um, this one, when I'm done reading it, I have to segment, bring them back to reality. And I describe the last picture slowly. I show them the cover. And then I start showing them this leprechaun doll. And the reason I did these dolls is as a segue. Because after I read the book, tell them how I got it published, you know, that's a lot of information for kids. So I figure I'll give them a little mental break, different visual. So I took, made this lucky, I mean, this Joe Scarecrow doll, lucky old leprechaun. <laughs> he has, my, or used to have my son's basketball on his head. <laughs> and this was my daughter's um, babysitter club doll. It was the only one with the right color hair. So I erased the face with my fingernail file, I painted on Lucky's face. Um, I cut her hair and made the beard and I sewed up the little outfit. So um, I, that's what I, what I use them for when I do presentations. Um, after those books came out, they asked me to illustrate a book. And um, the book is Little Thumb, right here. So I didn't write this one, but I illustrated it. And it's, um, a, po it's a poem. And it starts kind of negatively with, no, 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 into your mouth, I will not go. And it's about thumb sucking. So at first, I thought, I've got to make it be very um, charming and approachable and, and kind of cozy to kind of offset the negative beginning, because it does become very upbeat as it goes. So I did it in little bunnies, but they didn't want anthropomorphic uh, characters. So I asked my neighbor's doll, uh, doll, daughter to pose. So it was her first job. She was not very good at posing, but we, um, I took really quick pictures. She could stand it about 25 minutes. She made $25. It was her first modeling job. <laughs> and um, then, let's see, I got um, a book called um, Je um, Miss Boomstick School for Witches. And that was a book for hire, which means that you send it out they buy it, and then you don't get any royalties, which I wouldn't do again, because it's good to keep getting the royalties and not the publisher getting this. Um, and that book was published by Troll, and somebody else illustrated it, a friend of the woman that bought it, but she did a really good job. And that book um, is now owned by Scholastic Books, and I don't even know if they're printing it anymore. 
So um, the next book I'll show you, and this is the, oh, the next to last one. This is Sasha's Matryoshka dolls. Mm -hmm. And I did not illustrate this one. You can see it's different. The first illustrator they got, um, they uh, was too interested in the grandfather. And he was kind of, he was the grandfather of the Mohawk. It's supposed to be Russia around 1900. Mm -hmm. So um, then they hired someone else who had a really kind of depressive style. And I was thinking, oh, yeah. Taking me, I would have done this for either of these, but they didn't. This because a lot of times editors want to use their own artists because they have this huge backlog of artists. So if you're a writer and not an illustrator, don't ask someone else to illustrate for you unless you're going to self-publish, because um, they want to choose the illustrator, and if they don't like the illustrations, they usually won't take the writing because it makes it difficult for them to say, no, I'll take you, but not you. So anyway, this book came about from my daughter's um, Latrushka doll. And this is what I use when I do to, uh, children's presentations too, because when I show it, I show it at the very end, and by the time we get to the tiniest little doll, the children are laughing hysterically. And then sometimes the teachers look a little bit nervous, like, oh, is she going to get them back in control? But luckily, the last little one is, doesn't have anything in it, so I hold it up to my ear and I shake it, and it's so silent. All the kids get silent. And then I explain about how I thought of writing the story. And it's actually dedicated to my father, and it's about a grandfather who's bringing up his granddaughter and how he has to keep making larger and larger Matryoshka dolls for her because the animals keep running away with them. <laughs> so on the very last one, this one um, is based on my son. It's Upsy Downsy, Are You Asleep? And my daughter was selling magazines in seventh grade for the school and uh, the magazine I got was British Heritage. And so what I did was found different buildings from the magazines and I used them for the interiors and exteriors. So it was Britain, but it was Wales, Scotland, and England. And um, the idea for this one came from my son who didn't like to go to bed at night. When he was little I used to just sing him like Oh McDonald until I was down to kiwis and platypuses. I just kept singing. <laughs> so um, I dedicated the book to him, but it took so long to get published. I think I wrote it when he was um, in elementary school. It came out when he was a freshman in college. And I thought, should I mail this to him? The dedication so on it. I think he was embarrassed. But I did mail it. And he called me up and he said, Mom, I got the book. And I said, yes. And he said, do you hear the noise in the background? I said, yes. He says, I'm having a book party. <laughs> and he said, all my friends are here. He said, but you know what? He said, I had to pretend I was looking out the window because I got tears in my eyes. Aww. Thank you for writing this. Um, so my next book is going to have to be dedicated to my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I do have one self-published book, which I forgot about. My sister and I wrote one called The Year Maddie Divorced Her Parents. <laughs> and it's with Amazon. And it's kind of disappeared into the ether of the internet. Every once in a while I get a tiny, tiny little check, like $3 or something <laughs> like that. In fact, I think I'm just going to make it free if my sister will approve so that it gets more readers. But it's a young adult book about a girl that's very independent on how she survives. You know, she has drug addicted parents and she makes her way, like, she built her life at a new school at living with her grandmother. Um, and, uh, let's see. Um, so, I told you that my father is the one who was my inspiration in the beginning because he also not only did he paint, in fact, I inherited 400 of his paintings, which are all in my house. But um, he also would tell me stories. And my mother was the encourager. So right now, I have, I am working on an, maybe a young adult book, maybe an adult book, it kind of crosses over, but it's about the Salem Witchcraft Trials. Mm -hmm. And I, it had originally started as um, a series of ghost stories. And I had done a whole bunch of research on Salem Village because I lived there for a year and I didn't know any people in the town. So all I did was look at the old houses, drive by, research them, go to the library, read all the books about it. It was fascinating. So 
I'm writing that book now, and, I, and I've woven all the stories together with some main characters, a girl who keeps getting brought back into time from a splinter from the old parsonage, which um, actually is part of it still exists in Salem, is um, an L on the back of one of the um, parsonage that was built in the 1700s. So um, that's my latest. So, um, what I, I guess the main thing to tell you, since you're all writers, is that you can't give up. You just have to keep going and going. You have to ignore rejections, and you just have to keep going. And one thing that I discovered, too, was that since I write children's books, you go to the library and you get out tons and tons of children's books until you know that your illustrations and your writing is as good as the best of those books mm -hmm. so that you can be confident enough to keep sending something out without thinking, well, I know I didn't take that, I wasn't sure of it myself. Yeah. So, And I still have some books that I still want to get out that have been rejected innumerable times, but I haven't looked at them for so long, I'm going to look at them again and see what might be, um, you know, stopping them from getting published. So, that's it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I do. Uh, so, uh, as a writer going to publishers, you must get a lot of uh, advice and constructive criticism. How, how do you determine what you listen to and what you don't? Um, I have said no to things that just, I just didn't agree with. Um, and sometimes editors are, are just almost like young people that haven't been, aren't getting paid very much. Well. And you can see, like, like one editor wanted me to uh, put an exclamation point at a surprise and turn in the story. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted it to be a parent, not like bang someone over the head with, yeah. you know, you know, well, this is a surprise. I thought it was just really <coughs> amateurish, so I did the said, no, I don't want to do that. Um, but a lot of times, if it's a sophisticated editor, which most of them are, they give really good advice because they know they all they do is read books all the time, so they can quickly see what you're doing wrong. With um, Jeff Scarecrow's Pumpkin Patch, I have 12 pages of double space, and, and that was too long for a picture book. So the editor didn't tell me what to leave out, but she kept saying, "Shorten it," and I'd send it in, "Shorten it, shorten it." So it came out to be four and three quarters pages long. So I practically cut it in thirds. Mm -hmm. But when I went to schools and started reading it out loud, I realized, wow, that was wonderful advice because kids don't want to sit through really long things anymore. Like mm -hmm. books in the old days, yes, they would sit through them. Well, I sat through really long books. But now when you go into schools, there's a lot of kids that just, they're kinetic learners. They, they're moving. They don't want to, you know, to sit there and listen. So it has to be dramatic and fast. So, yes. Um, I'd like to ask uh, both of the authors what resources were really important to you in your, in your writing. I think people don't realize that writers don't just sit down and you know regurgitate a story out of their imagination. There's a lot of research that goes into it. Right? So, what what was important to the, the two of you? Um, well, for me, I work. For the Irish books, I read a lot of old Irish folk tales. Tales of the West of Ireland by um, Yates, I think it was, and um, Lady something or other. They could speak Irish, but even though they were English, they collected old stories, which are so fascinating. If you can get that book out of the library, you would love it. Uh, it's also horrifying in some parts. <laughs> but um, it made me... Um, see what leprechauns were like in their mind, and so I could integrate them in the stories. Um, the Scarecrow stories, um, I just remembered old cartoons I had seen as a child, um, and just thought of how people you know, decorate. Um, Sasha's Matryoshka dolls, um, I tried to find out how they were really invented. Mine is a made-up way they were invented. It was to um, promote patriotism and a pride of Russian things in about 1901 in Russia. And once they had been to the lay, I think it's called, that's how they were able to make them. Um, what I also did was I went to um, old movies for some of the pictures. Um, well, you know, these were from uh, a book, a, a magazine. Uh, Jeff Scarecrow, I would pose myself, like, with him like this, 
I would pose in the mirror and rush back and draw it. But the Irish books, um, this one, the Boston Globe, gave me um, pictures of children of different ethnicities. And the teacher in this is actually an African-American doctor who is also a dancer. And each time I copied them, I would change them enough so that, you know, say the doctor was reading this book and say, hey! <laughs> well, so I didn't want that to happen. Um, for this book, I rented old movies and I would put them on pause and then I would um, draw the people. So this little girl is Shirley Temple, but I changed her enough so it wouldn't fit suit. The little boy is the boy from Mary Poppins. And the old grand aunts um, were, um, the, this is a, a man, Nicolene Flynn from The Quiet Man. He was an actor who I realized was such a good actor by watching his body language. So he was great to copy, and he's also the leprechaun. <laughs> this one was the bartender in Darby O'Gill and the Little People. She was quite homely, so I kind of prettied her up. This is the mother from the music band. So um, that's some of my references. <laughs> Dean? Yeah. Um, I guess um, mine, uh, since it's all fiction, and I think there's a difference of, in terms of research between the fiction writers and the nonfiction writers, although I try to make, because they're all nature based, I try to make uh, uh, be as accurate as possible, um, but I have a tendency to go to the site that's in my mind. All of, I can take you to every place that's in the <coughs> books and sit there and feel the, you know, what the grass is like and what the environment's like and what the creature might be like. So it's a totally different type. It's not a library type of thing, except a lot of you know, going online and making sure that uh, I don't put out a weasel that's got four toes and still five. Um, you know, different, I think it's a different approach. Uh, how did you choose a weasel? Have you seen weasels? <laughs> and what? Um, you were here in the beginning. I, 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 he, he came to my granddaughter and I in the woods. Oh, okay. This little Thanks. character showed himself from the Yes. Uh, this is for both authors. Uh, how do you decide when? Do you feel compelled to write a particular story, or do you see a market? Is, is it is it an emotional or an intellectual decision? It is um, both. Um, for Jeff Scarpa, I wanted to write a Halloween book. For Lucky Old Leprechaun, I really wanted to write about leprechauns and Irish culture. I'm half Irish, a little bit of English on that side, and half Lithuanian. So, um, you know, I also have written Lithuanian fairy tales, but they haven't gotten published yet. So, um, it's both, it, but it's probably most love of the subject. What is really interesting in my mind, I figure it's going to interest other people. So. Oh, and Dean, did you want to answer that? Yeah, I have a little different approach to it. Um, Carolyn and I are working on a book right now, which is driven by the fact that Plymouth is going through its 400th anniversary next year, and I want to capitalize on that. And so it's, what I've done is it's a, it's a story about wild animals on, from Plymouth to Provincetown. And, um, and so I'm, I'm approaching it, as I said earlier, from a mar more from a marketing standpoint than <coughs> passion of... Uh... But it, it, the themes you, you, uh, you, you come back to evidently have some sort of deep meaning for you. Absolutely. Yeah, there's some emotion, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I, I don't know, I, I just feel as though when you write a book, you ought to have a marketing plan before you... <laughs> Before you start writing it, there ought to be a need, you know. Um, so. Any other one raising your hand? Yeah. Um, practical question size of illustrations, is that standard? Or is um, it, you, it seems to me that you, you should go to the library just to make sure, but it seems to me that they are doing things this size, which I think. Not in your own. When you, oh, my you own. You yourself, you try to do the same size. Or? I do do the same size, yeah. But um, if I was, if my eyes deteriorate as I get older, then I'll do them larger. 
in proportion and make them smaller. And you would shrink them, or they would yes. probably shrink them? Oh, they probably would shrink them. Yeah, they would shrink them. Yes. To your point of never giving up, my writer told me you can't call yourself a writer until you have a wall. Oh, yeah. Rejection. Oh, yeah. Each is an accomplishment. Yes. And they, they're in different levels. You'll get the standard rejection, and then everybody says, oh, it's great when you get one where they say, send some, we can't use that one, but send some more or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And then that's oh, something you're supposed to treasure, even though it's a rejection. Mm -hmm. um, see, we hope that was, was out of print and you had it reprinted by the mm -hmm. public. And when, how did you get Pelican to reprint it? Um, well, it was Pelican. And oh, Pelican okay. has published other books of mine. Oh, okay. And so they, um, yeah. because the biggest publishers are the ones you should try first. Like, you know, for us, Ross and Giroux, Park, Blue Brown, anything that's really big, try them first because they have the biggest power to market. They almost they get good reviews. It, it's a sneaky little thing that I noticed was that if you use a publishing house, that has a good reputation, you're going to get a good review. Because mm -hmm. the reviewers see the name and think, oh, this thing that got past on us, it's good. Mm -hmm. So they're subliminally influenced. <laughs> so um, try for the big publishers first. But um, how <coughs> they published it because I told them how many books it had sold. Yeah. So they said, wow, it was more than they sell. So, mm -hmm. yes. Um, speaking of the publishing piece of this, I'm a little confused. Um, I've always heard, as you said, that when you've written a children's book, you don't have to submit the illustration. The publisher wants to do that. But wasn't that, wasn't it the illustration that enabled you when you did your, your mock-up? Was it the I illustration so. that sold it? I think so because, so, um, you know, I think that if they had only seen the words and really it was a day where they were going, paying attention to it, it could have got published anyway, because I think the story stands on its own. However, I think because I had all the illustrations, it just stopped them enough to look at it. And at the time they had Chris Van Allsburg, was their big name, he did Jumanji, books like that. And when I sent in that book dummy, I had, the, he was, that year they were publishing The Witch's Room, and I had the exact witch's room, which I didn't realize, but that they had. And I did it in all that kind of shading, and pencil shading, his book, which is black and white shading. And I think they looked at it and thought, oh, this is like, it's got it. So that's another thing where it's just, you never know. Like if they, that day, Mary Lee Donovan had a headache, Mm -hmm. Or if she was crabby, she had a fight with her husband in the morning, maybe she would have just said, oh, I hate scarecrows. <laughs> so, in fact, I found out that that year got published, they accepted, I think it was six unknown people out of 6,000 submissions. So, yeah, a lot of it is just luck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For those of us who are self-published, would you ever recommend taking our book and submitting it to publishing houses? You know, sometimes publishing houses will, if a book is doing really well, mm -hmm. they will contact you. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know what they think about that. Like if they say, oh, well, it's only sold five copies or whatever it is, then you know, we don't want it. But you could ask, why not? Yeah. Yeah. I have um, I presented to a publisher. My theory was, if I do four or five books and they're good, they're going to come to me. <laughs> well, it hasn't happened. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I did have a conversation with a publisher and told them that I wanted to take, I had an idea that I want to take Chesterton to the national parks. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they were all over that. Mm -hmm. They wanted my books, and they they wanted to move on that. Um, I I dropped the ball. On that. I haven't pursued it because I, I still I again I think distribution. I don't need a publisher if I'm going to go write a book on Chesterton and national parks. I know where my market is. Yeah. It's each one of the national, national parks. parks. Mm. So why do I need to give my, you know, give the profits away to, to a publisher. Mm. So 
I have a kind of a warped view of, <laughs> of, of it all. But, That's helpful, thank you. Yeah. I was curious, Dean, um, what did you, or uh, how did you end up paying your young illustrators? What was the incentive besides experience? And, uh, was when how did I wind up paying? Yes, did you give them, like, I just, it what was, was the both, exchange? Yeah, so no, was, no they, they were paid. Okay. And, and it was a negotiation of, okay, how much do you think your art is worth? Okay. And I had two of them, you know, yeah, and I had right. to treat them as equals because they were both yeah. contributing. So, yeah. yeah, they were paid. Um, yeah, I didn't mean to ask what you paid them, but just did you pay them like in books or royalties off your way? No, I paid them, okay. paid them per, per illustration. Or per hire. Right. Okay. And um, what was the name of the Irish book that you said? Um, <laughs> uh, Lucky Leprechaun, Lucky. Oh, that book, that book. Yeah. Yeah. Tales of the West of Ireland. Thank you. I think it's by Liz Gregory and William Butler Yates. Oh. And there wow. are two of them, actually, okay. but I can't remember the name of the second one. But they went around to the old cottages and would mm -hmm. interview people mm -hmm. about ghost stories and the stuff they moved mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I guess I have another question. Unless you wanted to talk? Uh, just one, you, you trigger a thought. There's a book called Perennial Cellar. Uh. Um, and every writer ought to read it. Uh, or, or Is that with a C? Is that one? Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, okay. But it really, it really talks about um, you know, how do you put out something that is going to be a perennial seller and what goes into that? Uh, and that was recommended by a publisher. Uh, it's just a little <coughs> thing, but it's very, very informative. You know, about marketing, too. Um, the reason this book went out of print after 18 years is because I had stopped going to schools in the fall, hmm. just kind of slacked off. So um, if I had kept going to schools, um, it would have kept in print. Because when you go to schools, you sell a lot of books. Mm -hmm. When you do a book signing, you never know who's going to come. You might get a lot of people if there's big press. But if there isn't big press, you won't get anyone sometimes. And I've had bookstores, horrifyingly, I'll go to them. There was one in Westerly, Rhode Island. So I sat there, and people would come in, and I'd go, hi, and they'd just walk past me, trying not to look at me. And they and I sold notebooks. They had me sign up a bunch. They sold them after I left. Mm -hmm. So they asked me back the next year. And the same thing happened. And they asked me back the third year. And that year I said, oh, I can't make it. They'll sign copies. I'll send you book flights. Because, you know, that's excruciating to be sitting there. Mm -hmm. uh, Yes. So when you went into the schools, did you bring your books? Did you ask send letters to the families first and say, you know, you have to ask, like, how did you do that? What I do is I send a file out and I give them a choice. You, if you, um, you know, depending on how many presentations I do, there's different tiers of pricing. Okay. If you um, will allow books to be sold, then it goes down the price, you know, for each. Thing. And when Jetski Pro was one dollar less, they upped the price, but when it was one dollar less, I offered to go to schools free, no fee, as long as they bought a book for each child. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of schools that will pick up on that because they want the kids to have the books. Mm -hmm. okay. But if the book is expensive, they can't do it. And Jeb was borderline too expensive, but like kindergartens could do it, a whole school couldn't do it. Sure. Yeah, so, but if you want, oh, and also, so I send out those flyers, they email me, to mm -hmm. then we just find a time to come, and, they, okay. and I find out if they'll sell books or not. And do you find that this, I'm sorry if I'm monopolizing on No, no, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you find that there's a particular month or two or season that these schools will they? I guess they have even in March. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, I tend to get September, October, and March, but April's reading month, so I get April. Okay. And then there are some schools, for some reason, January and February. And that's okay, when there so might be no school, and it's kind of, you know. Yeah. 
iffy, but um, yeah, it, what I do is I read Lucky O Leprechaun in school because it's not um, just for St. Patrick's Day. Right. In fact, the okay. illustrations show it to be April because they were for Cynthia in Bloom. Okay. So, and it's something that, you know, he's living in the school year round. All right, yes. If you don't, if the school doesn't buy books, what do you charge to go to the school? I keep changing it all the time. So at one point I was charging six hundred fifty just for the for six presentations and whether they sold books or not. Now I've got it down and I kind of forget what I but I think what right now what it is is this. 200, 300, and 400 if they sell books. Mm -hmm. And Three, five, or six, or whatever. The next hundred dollars up if they don't sell books. Yes. And when you say you do a flyer, who are you uh, marketing to? The uh, administration book. Who I try different ones each year. So one year I'll do the, just to the kindergartens. Mm -hmm. One year I'll do just to first grade. One year I'll do to the PTA um, enrichment officer. Some years I'll do the principal. And you just never know who's going to pick up on it. You know, it's just as likely to be a PTA or PTO person as a principal, as one of the teachers. And I have some schools that ask me back year after year in their kindergartens because you know they always have this, and they don't mind hearing the same thing over and over. You know, so you know, like in Hingham, I've been to that school I think 20 times. <laughs> and in Halifax, the first time I missed it was last year, but it was 20 times with them too. And they will hear me do it in the morning, and they'll hear me do it in the afternoon. They don't care. And instead of watching me, since they know what I'm going to say, <laughs> they sit and watch the children's faces. You know, because they're fascinated with the children. The children have wonderful expressions. You can see exactly what's going on in your mind. So to them, it's just adorable. Yeah. I guess that's it. Any more? Well, thank you both. This has been wonderful. Wonderful. I think you can hear the, the richness of the opportunity to hear working writers and how they go about it, uh, the, the entire process. So this is the beginning. This is, this is week one of a seven-week series. So next Wednesday, Bob Reese and I uh, will be giving a, a presentation. We have a completely different type of uh, nonfiction writing. And, and Bob Reese does uh, different as well. I think he does children's writing, as far as I know. Um, and then Carolyn um, Lacan <coughs> is going to be the third week with um, Catherine Kelly. And so on and so forth. Bob uh, is going to be giving a, a presentation. Jim, who is very kindly back on the camera, mm -hmm. is going to be giving. And I. Uh, Donna Rockwell. And Don uh, Rockwell, yeah. okay. I think Don's in the other room. And uh, you mentioned you might be singing. Is this true? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I love my guitar. All right. Well, let's <laughs> not miss that. Let's not miss that. Yeah. So the schedule is on the. Uh, I'm sorry. And uh, yeah, Paulette. And you. My daughter Allison. So I'm not sure she, she's in Utah. So I'm not sure if she's coming. I'll oh, get two hats. So she all right. Fair enough. Fair enough. But that's on into November. So this is a seven-week series ending with a book sale. And I just wanted to take the opportunity um, uh, for everyone here and for anybody who might be listening um, elsewhere uh, to support local artists is, is very important and your writers are contributing as you can hear both Dean and, and Jana have been in the schools, they're part of the education of, of young people bringing certain messages to them. Mm -hmm. So I urge everybody to buy our books buy our books for your friends and family, or if you don't care to do that, buy them for a library and give our books to a, to a library. So, um, well that's about it. I thank everybody for coming. Great to see you.